GM, GM, can you hear me? Loud and clear, brother. What's happening? I'm going to try this thing. I'm going to try to... Oops. So now you're going to hear me echo. Yep, I know this Okay. Feeling. I'm trying to speak from the desktop while I'm hosting from mobile because I just realized that you can now. Really? Oh, wait. Yeah, you can speak from desktop. You can't raise your hand. That's what I remember. Yeah, I'm not going to be raising my hand. No, of course not. <laughs> I just I was thinking it's so strange that the two platforms are so differently abled. I guess it's really not strange, though. There's probably a much larger percentage of mobile users. Yeah, no, I've always thought it had to do with uh, the way that you measure activity metrics. Um, they're more significant when they are to do with a, with your mobile app than when you're uh, active on your website. I wonder why that is. I guess I just don't know the back end of anything. I don't really understand. Investment. Oh, word. Of course. Yeah, like you can you can measure, you know, uh, I guess visitors on site, number of pages visited and retention, um, which those traditionally are like some of the web uh, you know, desktop uh, web browser metrics. Right. Whereas, like with uh, mobile apps, you're looking at number of downloads and daily active users. And there's a lot of other metrics that are more significant to investors. And so a lot of times you just focus your energy uh, in that. Interesting. I mean, that's, I own a mobile app and there's not a desktop app to go along with it. So I guess my reasoning for doing that was probably very different though. I think my reasoning was closer to more than 80% of our user base is going to be on mobile. So why develop for 20% of them or not 10 or five even, you know? I wonder why you say that uh, in terms of the where the, your users are on mobile but not on desktop. You would think most people, uh, I mean, unless in, you're in some Asian markets, have a desktop and maybe not mobile. For this purpose, it's because people in the bar industry who are pricing and costing goods for sale are probably doing it on the fly from behind the bar, and most of them don't Got have it. a laptop. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's good. So wait, is this a new app that you've built? No, I, it's been out since like 2015 or 16. I just paid someone oh, wow. to develop it and like helped with the UI UX, and um, mm -hmm. was I was like the the core thought behind it, and then worked it out with mm -hmm. a dev team to make it happen. And it did not pay itself off, but it's probably coming <laughs> close many years later. I'm not good at monetizing things. I'm just good at solving problems. You know, darn it. Mm. Okay, I have something to say about that, but let me move my phone a little further away because I can still hear the echo. There's only a small bounce back, back, but it was there. You're right. Yep. Give, give me one moment. Okay. That's probably better. Sounds better to me. Okay. Um, anyways, quiet, uh, quiet space today. It's just you and me. I, I feel like this is almost like back, rewound the clock yeah. a few months now. Two years ago, a year and a half ago. <laughs> I think maybe this wasn't promoted um, on Link 3 or something, I, I would bet. Uh, yeah, I also got to say, I don't think Link 3 is uh, performing as good as it used to. I think you're right. Maybe it reached a saturation point. Yeah. I mean, I think most people, and when I say most people, I mean like most DGENs who are using the platform for their own kind of gains, profit, um, are going to get, like, move on to the next new thing. And I expect that that, that happened a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago, too, because I've been seeing Link 3 being less performant the last couple of weeks or months. Because I've only ever used it with the ontology thing, so I haven't seen how many people. I remember that first time that we used it, it was like oh my god, eight hundred people, and it pumped us right up to the front of any algorithm immediately. <laughs> Which for you know for better or worse, I don't know if the content was like what those people wanted anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, they're like, yeah, this is too smart. Like that's, we don't care about this. Smart that's the problem. That we were having critical thinking conversations rather than like gossip channel sports announcer stuff. And I think that usually when there's two thousand people in a space, it's the gossip channel uh, sports announcer stuff. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Um, 
Well, I, I, I changed the title. You know, I, I know the team likes to keep it open with Thursday talks, uh, but I changed the title to uh, Web3 Powering the Next Social Revolution. I, don't, I mean, I think we talked about it briefly. Um, you know, I think, because we also have not been pretty consistent with these. Uh, either I've been out of town on a conference or some other kind of life things have come, you know, come my way. Um, and I know one of the last things that we talked about and dove into, I know with you and then even with some other co-panelists was uh, friend, friend tech. But, you know, I think that there's still so much more to unlock when it comes to decentralized social or um, sufficiently decentralized social. So I, I guess just gener generally, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you've seen, what you've read, what you've heard in the kind of like the Web3 social space and anything that might be perking your ears. There has been, so since ordinals have taken off on big, of course, my response is going to have to do with Bitcoin. I think that there are very few problems that are actively being solved by any other um, ecosystems at the moment in terms of social network, but maybe I'm not seeing them because I'm not really as exposed to anything outside of the Bitcoin ecosystem at the moment, because I'm still in the middle of that deep dive. But the thing that I thought up this morning, and this is my own idea that I had in the shower. So, you know, if anybody hears this, I, there's only me, you and Battle, Battlefield, I assume. Anybody wants to develop this, go for it. I'm just going to say it out loud. Um, ordinals are not mutable. The inscription number that ordinals protocol proclaims for these things is kind of mutable and, and reorganizable because it's based on an indexer that's not decentralized. But anybody can spin one up so there can be many centralized indexers. So the inscription number is not necessarily what's immutable about it. The SAT that it is inscribed on is immutable. Um, you can't get rid of, you can't censor the SAT, and the SAT number is what it is. It's just a fact. Same thing with transaction IDs. So you can, you could, with recursion, which is basically turning an ordinal into a pointer to something either on or off chain, it doesn't really matter which, you could point an ordinal or one SAT's content to a phone's content. So I could have like a screen on my phone where I type, um, I love Christmas or I, I like sitting in chairs, let's say, and there's a picture of a chair. And then if you navigate on any indexer to that SAT, as long as they've chosen not to censor that SAT, um, or you can find a way to use a censorship-free indexer, you can view the contents of whatever that ordinal is pointing to. In this case, it could be my phone screen, whatever I've typed into this one particular box on my phone. And that means it would be fully stored on my phone, nowhere else, there's no intermediary, because it's just an immutable window into what's on my phone. And then I could change it to something else. So it could sort of be like a single page web page that is, there's no history and there's no centralized storage of anywhere, um, which I think is an interesting concept because if you factored in some sort of, I don't know, like a platform where I could follow Humpty's ordinal just by sat number, you know, we could disguise it by naming it something like giving it a handle if we wanted to, but it could just be sat number, you know, whatever 40 digits that is, or it's 13 digits or however many. Um, and then anything Humpty decides to write shows up on my screen, it's sort of like a MySpace top eight. You know, it's like I follow Humpty and I follow Polaris and I follow Ontology and I follow whatever. Um, and they all show up there as these immutable windows into whatever they're typing on their screen at that moment. And you can change it as frequently as you want. I think that that solves the social media problems we have. It doesn't make room for like, likes and upvotes and algorithmic tweaking, but I think maybe that's what's beautiful about the concept is that it's just the people you follow when you want to follow them and you can decide not to at any point in time. How people get these numbers and exchange their information, I have no idea. But I think the concept has legs and I think it's something specifically that Bitcoin as an immutable on-chain pointer to something off-chain potentially on your phone with zero history anywhere. Uh, there's something to be said for that. So that, uh, yes, Web3 will power the next social revolution. Are you seeing any of this kind of being tinkered with? I know you said this is kind of some of your thoughts and you're just putting it out there, but have you seen anybody, at least in that ecosystem, in the Bitcoin ecosystem, 
building something like that? Or is, is this why you're having that thought because you haven't really seen it yet? I've seen the onset of two technologies post ordinals or during ordinals. One is recursion and the other is reinscription. And I think they're both, and parent child inscriptions. That's kind of fun too. Um, I have not seen anybody building anything like this. I just see that new technology is being developed and we don't really, like we don't know where it's going yet. We don't, we just see that these new capabilities have come out and recursion, reinscription and parent child are three things that I think will allow Bitcoin to do things that it's never done before in a way that solves problems we currently have. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point. I mean, how do you, I mean, I guess, how do you see this potentially playing out? Um, I know you kind of briefly described the interaction where you can see the, I guess, live writing, uh, you know, of the person you're following. So is this more of a follow and, and see some sort of like live action or like what's, what's, what's the sticky, what's the stickiness to this product? I think that's the thing. I think it could be any single piece of that and it wouldn't matter which it could just be me texting my daily updates. You know how like people on Twitter will just say, uh, when it rains, it pours, so get a bucket or, you know, something, I just made that up. I don't know if that's real, like an actual saying, but um, people just say stupid stuff like that 10 times a day. And it doesn't really need to be saved. Like you don't need that to be taking up server space, especially not on Bitcoin, which is its own server essentially. Um, so this could just be stored centrally to people's devices and erased as soon as they erase it. So it's like all this fleeting content that makes blockchains and servers heavy don't really need to be around. So if we can find a way to not exploit that, but get all the use out of it, I think that solves a problem, first of all. And second of all, having on-chain pointers to off-chain materials. I'm sorry, wait, what, what was the question again? No, I mean, my, my, my question, I mean, I like the point you're going to right now, so please do continue. But the question I had was like, oh. what's the sticky? Yeah, why does anybody what makes care? The sticky? Right? Why, why do people keep coming back? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think at first it would only be ordinal specific people who would adopt it because, you know, people who are into the idea of something will find any way to use it they can and they'll rally around it. I think eventually if the platform, the user experience was made smooth enough or um, cohesive enough, it could provide all the things we love and all the things we fundamentally like ideologically don't like about social media because there'd really be no way to mine anything out of it in any other way than like digging through data and manually mining it, you know, because nobody has to sign up for anything. You just sign up. Well, I mean, you do sign up for the, the service. You have to download the app, right? It could just, I really don't know what that would entail to be honest, but ideally you would just connect to that sat. Like when you sign up for the app, it just mints on, on ordinals or on Bitcoin rather, it mints that immutable window that is now connected with your phone. That's it. And then you send everybody your thing and you get to say what you want to everybody without bothering them. And they get to electively look at it. It's sort of like a gigantic group chat that you kind of curate your experience of, if that makes sense, in, in my head. But again, I just had this idea in the shower this morning. It's not fleshed out at all. What yeah. I see it as a usage of a new technology that solves a problem in that it can't be censored. Your viewership mm -hmm. of it based on one single indexer probably can be, but if you can find a way to view the Bitcoin blockchain, which you can, if you try hard enough, um, none of it can be censored. And that can be used for yeah. anything, both good and bad, just like every other technology, you know, jet engines and whatnot. Right. So, I mean, you're seeing this as a, you know, and, I, and I'm only digging because, I mean, I think it's an interesting topic, like uh, just generally, like. The, the 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 social element of the web i think is really in my opinion what's made it super popular right um the the ability to connect with people um from around the world you know without necessarily having to know them or trust them uh to be able to um you know find uh, i guess common interests and connect with groups who share common interests to be able to communicate, quote unquote, freely, right? Because you can create an account and you can start chatting with someone without necessarily asking for permission. Um, and then to be able to kind of host and interact with dynamic media, I think all of these things 
have really allowed the web to flourish. Um, I, I think that the reason why a lot of the popular web applications today are social networks is, you know, it, it, there's no surprise there um, because there's there's that, uh, I guess, that um, innate interest and innate uh, part of ourselves who are social beings um, that want to connect with other people. And sometimes doing it virtually is a lot easier than doing it in person, too, for some people. Um, so I think one of the things that I've seen recently and I'm, I'm pretty deep in, in maybe one or two decentralized social uh, platforms, just trying to connect with people there and seeing what the value is of, of, of decentralized social, um, seeing what the value is of the technology that's built on top of it, you know, right? Or like how it's integrated, you know, how blockchain and crypto is integrated to it. Um, I, I think I would say that for the last two years, I've been reasonably... Um, learning and, and, and participating in the Lens ecosystem. And for the last year, probably more so now in the last couple of months, uh, participating in the Farcaster ecosystem. And it's just really interesting to see the two approaches, right? Which then I would say have two very different philosophies um, in terms of what like decentralized social can, can do. Um, with Lens, it's like everything's on chain. Uh, and some people might say that's definitely the way. Right. If everything's on chain, then everything can have ownership. Right. You can own things, um, you know, in perpetuity because you are the one who is signed that and it's connected to that identity. Um, others might say that's inefficient, uh, very uh, cost inefficient uh, and time inefficient. Right. Because you're having to put everything on chain. There's a cost associated to that. Um, both in terms of uh, uploading something to the chain, uh, you know, attesting to that uh, on chain and then paying for the fees to load and store that on chain. Like all of these things are, um, you know, either paid by the user or sometimes uh, subsidized by the platform, which then that just means it's subsidized by investors. Um, and then, you know, there's forecasters like, well, we're going to try to retain some level of efficiency where we are not putting everything on chain. We're putting your identities on chain because we want you to have ownership over those things. Um, maybe some other elements of it, but everything else remains off chain. That said, there's still other things that you could integrate to this uh, Web3 social platforms. And I think that are being experimented with today. And one of those things are NFTs, right? Like, I know where this is not your podcast where we don't say NFT. Uh, we so still do I'm say NFT say on the don't say <laughs> NFT podcast. Well, I think the joke is that you don't say it until someone does. Yeah, and uh, I haven't used the buzzer yet, but somebody always does. And actually, it's oh, yeah, like 45 or 50 minutes every time for the last three or four, which is, I think, a really good sign because the conversations are way bigger. Yeah, you're than making that. improvements. Yeah. Um, sorry. So. All this to say that I think that, you know, then there's other kind of primitives that can be associated to either your identity or to your social, um, you know, I guess your social identity, uh, where it can add value both to you and your persona or to your audience who's following you. So anyways, it's a very long winded way of saying there's also in the space of like decentralized social, tons of experimenting to see what could be the most efficient and in my opinion, the most fun, because if it's not fun, then I'm not coming back. That was actually the first thing I thought was, I know we can do this. I know we can make these like immutable windows to a screen on someone's phone. That's definitely possible. But where's the upvoting? Where's the liking? Where's the dopamine? People aren't going to use it unless they can get some kind of a rush out of using it. And I think it's a benefit to have no history at all, but just to have the space where you're doing it be immutable. Um, I'm looking forward to, I, I already put this through a couple of group chats for with Bitcoin devs in them. And I proposed it to one of the people who works in a big project on the like fundraising side. And uh, we'll see, we'll see where it goes. And if it, if the idea has got legs and if it doesn't, then, you know, most ideas don't have legs and <laughs> you just have to sort through them, I guess. Right. Uh, and that's, 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 I think what's the most fun about watching this separate developer seek ecosystem burgeon 
is all of the new things that can be done with it, even if most of them don't stick, they're explorations of concepts that might eventually build into something that does. Yeah, and I think to that point, it's interesting to discuss what social could potentially look like in, in a future web, right? I think there's a paradigm that we associate with social um, because I, I would say in the web two space, maybe the web one space was certainly very different. It was not very dynamic. Um, it is, you know, we've, we've come to associate social experiences through some of the, so, the, the, the popular social apps like Facebook, or I would say even YouTube, then Facebook, then Instagram, uh, TikTok, Twitter, somewhere in there, um, and how that has evolved, both in terms of the content that we can create, right? Because we go from text-based to video-based, and we go from long-form to short-form content, but also the uh, reach that we have um, and kind of the connection then that we can make both with creators and the communities that are built around those creators. Um, so I, 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 it's interesting to think that Web3 potentially can break that paradigm and introduce a new one. Um, and I, and I, by the way, I saw you post something and I'm on your Twitter account or your X account now, and I'm seeing that your pinned tweet is a social experience, if, if I'm not mistaken. I was actually, I didn't want to bring that up because it would have felt like shoehorning in something else I'm doing. But I, I do think that No, this but is... we're talking about social yeah. revolutions and I don't want us to get too stuck on thinking about like social in such a traditional sense, right. at least Pigeonhole. The, 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 the way that it is today. So please do talk a little bit about that because I'd love to kind of explore that and see how that is potentially breaking the paradigm this... using the technology that exists. Thank, yeah, thanks, man. I... I was going to do it eventually because I was just starting to think that it's relevant. So good. I'm glad that, <laughs> I'm glad that you prompted me to. Um, this is like, we're not saying don't say reforms, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Can't say reforms. <laughs> Anyways, go, man. Reform. We, uh, yeah. the, I was on a Twitter space last Friday, I think, or maybe it was last Thursday. It might have been like a week ago. It was less than a week ago, fully. And I was talking about how I have uh, incurred a traumatic brain injury in the year 2000 that I'm recently realizing what it actually did to my head in terms of like what I'm capable of and what not, not capable of physically, not like in my life. And it turns out there are two kinds of long-term memory. This is relevant, by the way. It's not just me talking about myself. And maybe I've even said it to you before and I forgot. But there are, which is ironic, right? There are two kinds of long-term memory that we store as humans. One is practical and one is uh, declarative. Practical memory is when you like, you walk up to a door and every door in the world you recognize as a door and you know how to open it. You really don't have to think about it. It's just a, it's like a regurgitation of a process. Uh, that's procedural memory. And then there is, um, what's the other one? Declarative memory, which is when you ask me what I had for dinner last night, and I have to file through each, each of the images in my head and go, oh, pizza. And I find it and I go, pizza. I tell you about it by, by imagining that pizza. I don't have that second kind. So I don't know what my wife looks like. I don't know what my mother looks like, and I don't know what you look like until I see you. And then practical or procedural memory, or whatever the hell it's called, um, takes over. And then I know, I know you, I understand you, and I know how to interact with you. And just like there are many doors, the different versions of Humpty that wear, like one of them wears a hat, some has different glasses, and there's always different clothes on it. I know all of them as a Humpty, and I know how I interact with a Humpty. So quite the same with my wife. I recognize her as a, let's say in this case, a plant pot or like a rubber tree plant. She is, there are many different rubber tree plants, but I, I understand them all to be rubber tree plants. And I know how I, how I interact with them. So my whole life is that. And when I was working in restaurants uh, six months ago, we worked in the same restaurant together, me and my wife. And we did an experiment where everybody in the restaurant, there were probably 50 people, they all drew a rat if they were a rat, like themselves as a rat. And most of these rats came out with a lot of character. Some of them were like video game level 200 power, strong guy rats. Some were like motorcycle cigarette smoking rats, uh, you know, bad boy rats. And some were like bubble fairy princess rats. But each one of them looked distinctly different as if each person imagined a specific rat and drew it from the inside of their head. And my rat looked like that rat, the one that you're looking at in my pinned tweet. And it's sort of like, no rat. It's every rat and no rat. It is simply rat. 
Uh, it's not a rat. It's like if I was a rat, I would just be that rat standing on my two legs because that's what I do as a human. So this fit really well into the narrative of the kind of brain damage I had. And I realized that I can't draw a rat. I can only draw rat. The, like the platonic form of what a rat is, the things that all rats have in common that we recognize them by is what's stored in my head. So I thought, well, why don't we exploit this and use it as a part of flexing a new technology that's arrived on Bitcoin. And so with ordinals, you can inscribe onto one Satoshi some data. And sometimes that data is a JPEG. So it looks like an NFT. What you can do now is re-inscribe that same in Satoshi without overwriting any previous data because you can't, right? And they all just fall in a line into an inextricable, immutable chain. So I thought to myself, what a weird social experiment this is. Like, it's not fun for me to draw a form and then scribble more things onto it. It'd be really fun if I drew a form, a base model of a form, and then sent it to some random person to do the same thing, but from their eyes. And uh, this one turned into a link of about eight inscriptions so far, which is the most ever in recorded history, because everything before that was just, I think there was a maximum of two. So I made this first one that has so far seen eight, and it's stuck in the mempool due to low fees. There's already 12 more slated for it, and it's going to be over 25 or 30 is the second it comes out of uh, the mempool, which is like the waiting, it's purgatory for people who paid low fees, because I'm an idiot and I paid low fees. But never fear, I was really upset by this at first because it was like day number two of the experiment, and this thing got stuck in the mempool when it was about to make like probably unbreakable history. And I still don't think anything's gone over eight inscriptions. Um, so it's not that big of a deal. And it's not like, it, you know, it, whether we're first to do it or someone else is first to do it, the fact that it can be done is the point. Um, so there's already eight rats on this rat, and there will be 25 rats on this rat whenever he comes out of the mempool. The good thing is there are 68 more images, and the next one is being released tomorrow, and it's a clock. And it's not a clock, it's just clock. The one after that is speaker, and then fly. And then there's a $5 bill, but it's not dollars because it's from nowhere. It's just like a five on a piece of paper. And the one after that says once in the font that you would see once upon a time. So prompting people maybe to write stories or to individually inscribe a word at a time as they pass this JPEG around. Um, only the person who holds the ordinal in their wallet can inscribe on it. So that means that if I send it to someone, they could burn it to Satoshi's wallet, send it somewhere inextricable. Um, they can inscribe their own art on it 10 times in a row and they can sell it if they want, or they can not inscribe anything ever and just keep it, or they can pass it around their friend group and then sell it to another art collective and have that art collective inscribe all of their stuff on it, at which point maybe they would sell it to another art collective and so on and so forth. So there are 69 of these in total, because of course, and that means the last one, if I drop one per Friday at noon, which is what's gonna happen, uh, will be released December 20th of 2024. At which point we'll look back and see how long these chains have become, and there's no way to stop them. People will just do what they're going to do with them, and that's the point. No rules. Whatever you think of when you see it, you do. Um, and no one can control it but the holder. So that's, I mean, that's a social experiment in, in and of itself. I want to see if people develop a market price for these, and if they end up selling for any amount of money to anybody or if anyone cares or if everyone doesn't because there's no long-term validation and there's no likes, you know? But if you get to partake in some sort of immutable piece of history by getting your hands on one of these things um, and putting whatever you think on it, that's re rewarding enough for some people, I think. So I, I'm excited to see how it plays out, especially when the second one drops tomorrow. The next two are being sent to artists not from Bitcoin, but one from Ethereum and one from Solana, neither of whom have a Bitcoin wallet at all. And I'm getting on a Twitter space with each of them probably tonight uh, to help them download wallets and talk them through the process. So we're, we're getting people from all over, not just an insular community, to, you know, add their take on life to this thing. Pretty exciting concept. You know, it's actually really interesting that you, at least one of the latter examples you shared, which was where you prompt them with one word, which is once, and then leave it open-ended where people can then use that as a way to write a story together uh, on chain, right? Um, I think that's really interesting because I, one of the most powerful forms of human connection is storytelling. Um, and obviously that can be used for good or bad, 
right? Propaganda, I guess, would be a bad form of that. But what I'm trying to say is storytelling is a is, is a good tool for relating kind of ideas and bringing people together through those ideas. And you're kind of like leveraging the technology to build this like giant letter, um, which is actually funny because it's like, because it's on chain, you can consider it a chain letter. <laughs> I For remember real. those things. Yeah, yeah, totally. Bro, <laughs> you can literally brand this as an on-chain letter, um, you know, game, uh, which I, again, just leverages whatever technology is at your disposal. Because if you remember the chain letter thing was leveraging email, which was brand new at that time. And people were experimenting with that technology. And you're kind of doing the same thing now. And that was a social experiment. This is a social experiment. And I think that's what I mean. It's like, we can't be bound by this idea of what social uh, is restrained by the, or constrained, excuse me, by the, uh, the, the definition of it based on the technology of the parameters that we have today. Uh, Sheldon, you came up uh, wanting to speak. Also, if anybody's raising their hands, I have to go back to my phone every once in a while because I'm speaking from the desktop and I do not see your hand coming up. So I might just make Donnie the co-host. I'll keep my eyes on it. In case anybody wants to come up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it, Sheldon. Hey, so um, instead of prattling off a bunch of stuff I may have picked up in a, a single sociology class that I took, um, I just wanted to point something out and I, I think it's, Really funny that you mentioned chain mail because if you see I'm wearing a freaking PFP. I, you know, y'all don't know me, but I've been active in crypto for many, many years. Um, and I don't mean like four, I mean like closer to 10. And, um, you know, there's a lot of cool things that have happened here. And, you know, there's been years and years of us like really hoping and praying that social experiments would, you know, take hold and be successful. But I think that your reference to email is, is actually like secretly super productive. So I wanted to run with that for just a second. And I, I try to be concise when it's not my spaces and I'm trying to just run things like I'm, I'm not a host. I'm just some guy talking who wanted to talk to y'all for a second. Um, that reference of um, chain mail rem reminds me what it was when I'm, you know, I tried to ask other people to email me in the 90s and, you know, I was pretty young at the time and a lot of people just didn't. And, um, you know, the the unified platform of, oh, you can type in somebody's, you know, something at something and then you'd be able to reach them. It's wildly different from what we all want decentralization to, to mean but also it means that there isn't a single TikTok, a single Twitter, a single place where that stuff makes sense. So I, I, I do really appreciate that point because I think you're right about that. But I also think we're kind of at this like simultaneous rock in a hard place kind of position. Mastodon being a great example of that because Mastodon took off for a little bit. I don't know what it's like now, but I never got on because I just don't care about social media platforms. But they're a good, you know, baseline or reference for this kind of activity where you're, you're trying to see if people are going to communicate and interact with each other in a, you know, a manner that will keep a platform going. That'll be reasonably sustainable enough to um, to to keep paying the cost to keep the stuff going. You know, yeah, Web3 has a little bit more of that sort of like incentive versus operating cost stuff. And I, I'm really grateful for that. But that um, that chain mail like experience i think that's a great start i just there's not a, a place that i know of today that is taking inscriptions and you know recording block height or transactions from other chains or you know providing pointers to uh, ipfs that are you know not just hosted by protocol labs like there there isn't a, a really like short throw very feasible implementation that is easy bode that is like super tangible for the average person, right? So I, I, I do hope that Web3 would power the next social revolution, but at the same time, the next social revolution really can't look like the ones that we're used to, or it's just not gonna be a revolution. It'll just be a, oh, hey, Threads is cool now. You know, like I don't see that being productive. I don't see that taking off, but that was why I wanted to, to give you all a, a moment about it, because 
Yeah, go, go ahead, Humpty. I'm not trying to talk too much. No, no, this is great. That's, trust me, I, we, we can go down tangents and we could definitely be pretty long-winded, so it's good to hear a, a different voice. I, I did want to ask you something because um, being that you've been involved in this space for you know 10 years and I'm going on seven, um, I, I'd be interested to un, like understand from you, I guess, po poke holes into this idea of mine, right? Because this is something that I've been thinking about for some time. You mentioned um, how email, you know, then, and, and I'm old enough to have seen the internet, you know, become popular, not be born, but become popular. Um, I, I do remember like all of these different um, social interaction points like email were novel and not fully adopted by everyone. Whereas now, I mean, it's like, if you don't have an email, where am I going to reach out to you? Like your phone number? Like it's, it's, it's that uh, a big part of like our, our daily lives. So one of the thoughts that I have though, when you say that is email while decentralized in its protocol, right? Only became popular when certain ISPs, right? Service providers, maybe sometimes there were internet service providers like AOL and Hotmail and Yahoo. And so other types of service providers uh, made, created a front end that was uh, pretty, right? Maybe uh, interesting, like I'm trying to find the right word here, um, usable, right, accessible. Like it, they created something that allowed a pe group of people who may not have been part of that first wave of adopters, but you know, uh, part of that next wave, who then said, okay, I'm going to go through the trouble of signing up to create an email so that people can shut up and Ask, stop telling me to get an email. And now they can actually have a place where they can send these messages to. I still don't think that much of the decentralized, many of the decentralized applications have that type of ease of onboarding, stickiness, accessibility. And one of the things that, although it crushes me, um, I think will be what has some truth is that in some future, in order for Web3, or let's let's just call it what it is, crypto to have any general adoption, we're going to have to see these centralized institutions, similar to your Microsoft Hotmail and Yahoo Mail, uh, develop these front ends that are that are fun and accessible, which leverage the technology, like the protocol, right at the at the at the lower end, at the lower level, but on the higher level, like the what everyone sees, isn't fully decentralized. Right. So the service providers that I'm thinking about right now, which I think are going to be a necessary bridge, I don't know if they need to be a permanent solution, are your Coinbase's of the world, right? Your Binance's of the world, where they're providing a front end that looks super fun, super accessible, show me all the pretty pictures, make, you know, use marketing speak that connects with me. And now I have my email, right? Quote unquote. But in this case, I have a, um, you know, a, 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 an address, a wallet address that I can interact with on chain, but it's not necessarily something that's fully mine, just like my Gmail is not fully mine. Does that make sense? Like, I wonder, like, either Donnie or Sheldon, if you want to take that, it'd be, I think that's an interesting question based on what we're talking about right now. I know it's a bit of a well, tangent off the initial. No, you're fine. L let me, let me uh, take it and then I'll, I'll probably drop back down to listener. I, I should have started with the preface that I'm in. Vietnam and it's freaking 3.30 in the morning. Um, but I, I think that there's a really significant place where you're right about that. And I, I was biting my tongue to not be rude and interrupt and be like freaking piles and piles of AOL CDs because that was how that happened to, to, to my knowledge and experience is that, oh, hey, you better get an email. You're going to need to sign up for this service at some point or you'll need an email to be able to do something. Um, you know, here's an AOL CD. You can use this for free. Um, but, like, you're, you're definitely right about the front-end part, but I, I think you skipped a part about the protocol part, and, and that's what I want to focus on because I'm an infrastructure guy. What can I say? Um, IBM and a handful of universities and the U.S. government all saying not just after being willing to accept DNS as the thing that they're going to use – but going beyond that and saying, okay, 
we were already maintaining these um, large name services databases and systems that are, you know, funneling back and forth. What number is this? Who is this number? Um, you know, we, we were already doing that. Now we might as well have MX services or mail record services. It, it did take an existing like unification of that protocol for it to really sweep up because there, there already was, you know, alternatives, not just in Russia and China and a couple of different countries, Japan also, there, there was already alternatives to these kinds of things. Um, but because the, um, you know, unification of the landscape in the U.S. kind of became explosive. There's a bunch of other economic things that we won't waste time on about IBM uh, getting popular in, in other countries and stuff. Because there was this reasonable business motivation to say, hey, we're already spending this money. You know, it's not going to be a significant increase in cost. Let's ask these servers to do a little bit more, and then we'll get more out of them, and then we can offer services based on that. And, you know, in some cases, give away services in order to get people more addicted to this sauce. Like, I see us kind of skipping that in crypto. And it's not because someone decided that there's a new standard on Bitcoin where you just throw some JavaScript together and, and name somebody and bam, now that's their name, .ptc. It, it's not that. Um, it's that these things are not supposed to be one unified platform or system. I mean, I, I very much like the idea of Bitcoin drive chains and the way that we could use Bitcoin as a relay to all these other different formats of protocols, but that's years away at best. Like that, that infrastructure part, that's where I feel like we're, we're stuck culturally because it takes that unification to really get the social momentum across, you know, not just multiple countries, but you know, multiple casts, I guess you could say, like, sure, a rich person will, will, you know, spend money on these kinds of things. I'm, I guess, by modern standards, I guess I'm affluent. I'm, I don't think I'm a rich person. I have like a Bitcoin or something ish. Like, I, I, I think that for those of us that do have some sort of disposable income, it's much easier to consider something like owning an ENS with our name. But for a regular person, it's still not because not just because that it's not free, but, you know, getting to the banking system to do all of these things, like reaching the point where you're meshing up with Coinbase and then deciding, hey, I want to see this brave new world. It looks like it's going to be worth it to me. You know, let me move my uh, polygon outside of, uh, you know, my Matic or, or whatever they're calling themselves now, you know, move that outside of a centralized exchange and start doing some cool stuff with it. Like, I definitely agree with you that there is a um, lack of user experience that's unified. And I kind of hate saying UX because God, everybody says UX now, but like I, I'm just a little bit um, sad sometimes because we're in a system where we're not supposed to be hyper unifying protocols. And it kind of seems like we need to anyway, to move into like a next social revolution kind of phase. I mean, that was one of the reasons I, I got into ontology a really long time ago. And that's how I found the space is because I happened to be following the ontology account. I really liked the idea of having tooling be a, unif a unifying factor and not worrying so much about the capital part of it. And that's the responsibility of the tool to make sure that it's valuable and, you know, worth operating. But um, I'm struggling a little bit to see how it's going to make sense. Not because ontology is doing anything wrong, um, but because I have a few advisory clients and I talk to lots of projects and, and try to do helpful stuff. And we do pretty frequently run into this wall of, oh, hey, there's some Polkadot people or, oh, hey, there's some near protocol people or some, you know, Ethereum is still kind of the, the, the market popular thing. But, you know, how helpful is that? Oh, good. We have 50 different little mini versions of Ethereum and now we're moving on to orbit chains that are L3s of a, uh, you know, slightly different version of, of Ethereum for a specific purpose. I'm rambling too much to say that we were supposed to have some of these problems and they are socially and structurally different than the last system. So I, I feel like the revolution is not going to come until people know it's not going to be televised because if the revolution's coming to you, ooh, buddy, let me tell you what you're not having, a revolution. <laughs> You know, you're 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 having a a, a a resolution to revolt without knowing what you're revolting against. But I don't know. I don't mean to get all hyper political about that it. That should be a bumper sticker. But you get my point. That one that one line <laughs> that was we should stop the space right now. That was
top. Thank you for speaking up. You're not rambling um, Thanks, buddy. at all. <laughs> also, I've never heard anybody say drive chain outside of the ordinal space. So I'm really glad to hear that that's made it somewhere where smart people are hearing it. Uh, because I th also think the comp the concept is super. Oh, interesting is a boring word, but that's what I'm going to use for right now. I think you're right. All of the products that we think are going to solve problems because we have this like idealistic view of what's going on, they're like they might as well be Magic the Gathering. Like I'm not, I can't. I as much as I might like it, it doesn't solve a problem for my mother and her friends. So when does this start solving a problem for my mother and her friends? And how do we get it to the point where we don't have to talk people into it? to exercise the ability to solve these problems with this technology, you know, Humpty. Yeah. Well, I said I was going to shut up, but let me give you my yeah, go drive chain theory for a second. <laughs> Cause yeah, I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep it relatively short. Um, I, I did talk to Paul about this. I, I happen to be from Miami and uh, Paul Storch, the guy who um, got the, the grant and published BIP 300 and BIP 301 years ago, um, super nice guy. I, I love the sort of openness that he's kind of willing to talk to anybody about it. I had some esoteric uh, comments and ideas and, and security things to talk to him about. And he was super cool about it. So shout out, Paul. I, I really appreciate the attitude of those guys just generally. But the idea that drove Bitcoin um, into the current market state that we're in, <coughs> where everyone's trying to do cool and interesting compute things outside of Bitcoin is based on that one fucking time that Vitalik came to the Bitcoin conference in Miami and tried to tell a room full of Bitcoiners, hey, we should be doing compute on the most secure platform in the world, which right now is Bitcoin and probably will be Bitcoin in the indefinite future. We don't have to undo Ethereum to bind security of many critical operations back to Bitcoin. Syscoin's trying to do this. They've been trying to do it for a long time. They're really struggling. Liquid isn't super popular, um, you know, besides LN, nobody really cares about Chainx and a bunch of other tiny L2s, right? There's all of this stuff that does actually hang off of Bitcoin that people don't appreciate because it's not delivering significant value. It is for the, the very, you know, special niche folks like I'm sure some of y'all listening and me, but the theory that I have for drive chains is not that all the POS chains need to come home. No, that's silly. That's ridiculous. But the idea that you would use drive chains as economic tools, i.e. you would be willing to spend a certain amount of Bitcoin to, let's say, operate a decentralized exchange where you're binding the security of that exchange, where transactions on that exchange don't settle to the mainnet of Bitcoin, but they settle to a drive chain, which is then responsible for keeping up with a hash time lock contract. And if nobody knows this silly stuff about drive chains, it's basically just putting Bitcoin to the side and then gradually moving it in little pieces over and over and over again and allocating that spend to certain UTXOs and information being completed on a sort of mini side chain of Bitcoin. It's completely reasonable, I think. Um, and I, I do... Uh, have a, a, a dream that I could help with this sort of thing, but I'm not nearly smart enough to execute the, the stuff that I would theorize to some degree. But the the reason I mention it is not because everyone needs to come home. It's because there are things that are attack worthy in every ecosystem. That's ontology. I'm very active in near protocol. Obviously Cosmos has all these capital relationships, some of which are, <clears throat> you know, like less than $10,000 strong. These things are vulnerable. So instead of crying wolf and saying the sky is falling, um, besides my you know other enjoyment in participating in things like Cosmos, where stuff is like supposed to be very segmented, but everyone kind of gets along and protocols mesh together more over time, like we shouldn't have to go do that with every different product that wants to strike out, innovate, be the best thing ever, impress a bunch of VCs, take over a small portion of market share, and then normalize we could just start with the normalization of what is already legally compliant in hundreds of countries, which is Bitcoin. So, I mean, I, I, I'm expressing it really rambly and I see myself, I need to fucking streamline, slim this down. Um, but in effect, because drive chains are custom side chains on Bitcoin that can do stuff, 
you know, that can be responsible for compute based on MIP301. They become responsible for binding to whatever you want to merge with mining, which is the same relationship that Litecoin and Doge have, right? It's kind of like known, proven success, even though it's not perfect. Um, there's no reason why we can't be binding those important things. So I, I think it's a funny thing to say in front of the ontology account. And I don't know if somebody's sitting behind there quiet, just listen to me, you know, throwing a, a, a frown. But like, I, I do wish that there was less of this competition in a tooling space because the nature of what we were discussing before is that you have to come to the tooling partner in order to get the tooling. That was not how email worked because there was an alignment of how DNS worked, of how MX records and servers should work, of maybe not how the front end works, but you know, it was kind of standard, right? It's like there's the address field, there's the subject field, there's the body of your email. Like that stuff was all really like standardized and, and we're not there yet. Okay, so I wanna I wanna touch on two things. One thing that Donnie was that had said, and just now to touch on this again, because uh, I think this is the second time you mentioned Sheldon. Um, and then I'll preface all of this by saying I'm behind both accounts. So I launched the ontology Twitter space from the brand account, and I'm now speaking from my personal account. So there's there's no frowning over there. There's just a uh, phone sitting behind a pillow cushion uh, <laughs> in the sofa behind me. Um, that said, the first thing I wanted to touch on was, Donna, you said, oh, you know, in terms, I think you were talking about <sighs> Magic the Gathering, I think you were talking about, and how in that social uh, experience, there's nothing that your, I think you mentioned your mom or someone, uh, there's nothing for her to, you know, relate to and, and learn from and, and understand. I would say that's maybe wrong, because when you think about a game mechanics, are true mostly everywhere. A lot of the game mechanics that we learn from games like Magic the Gathering end up being used elsewhere. A lot of times these game mechanics are used in business, in startups, in social uh, psychology, right? For, for social networks to become stickier and, and really drive engagement through the roof. Um, so I don't think that it's fair to say that Magic the Gathering doesn't have any relevancy. I think it's just a matter of um, you know, the specific context and the application of that outside in some sort of um, non-trading card uh, game environment. Thank you for clarifying so, that for me. I'll say that. Because yeah. that's what I meant when I said yeah, that. I, yeah. I didn't mean to say that the things that we're building and partaking in right now don't have value to these people. I mean to say that they don't know that it has the value enough to yeah. switch over to these things or the, you know, I didn't, take, to I didn't take it as a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't take it as a bad thing. I took it as a, maybe this is what I understood and just wanted to clarify. So glad it, we're on the same page on that. Um, then to respond to Sheldon's point, which I think was uh, quite, quite poignant, and I think that's why uh, he repeated it, is this idea of standardization being a barrier. I couldn't agree more. I think that until we start to see standardization of this technology, it's going to be very difficult for us to see a wider adoption to it. And the reason I don't think I need to explain it to this group here, I think this group understands it, um, is that standardization predates Web3, right? Like things like HTML, TCP IP, um, you know, MX, you know, records and just, just everything, all these other protocols that we use today to be able to uh, browse the internet, to be able to log in to a website, to be able to send and receive emails, like all of these things are only possible because there were standards that were developed from competing uh, platforms, right? From competing protocols. Um, I, I still do remember, my gosh, it's, it's, I'm really having to like rack my brain here, but there were uh, different protocols proposed by like Xerox uh, and Dell Labs and a lot of the original, you know, technology companies that were pushing forward uh, a lot of the internet uh, protocols, which until those were standardized, I mean, I think even printing, Apple had its own printing protocol, uh, you know, Microsoft had its own printing protocol, and that's why you needed to install drivers. I remember if you were going to be printing from an Apple that would not work on a, on a Windows PC and vice versa, and sometimes you didn't have those drivers included it with your printer when you bought it because it was meant to be just PC compatible. So yeah, I remember those days. I remember having to print 
and how it was not a very intuitive and simple thing to do. So I agree with you, Sheldon. And I think this is the something that I've, I've challenged, not just internally, right, at Ontology to look outward to see how we can collaborate. But this is also true just generally for anyone building any protocol of significance uh, in the Web3 space. Because one thing I, I'm open to, and I say in terms of identity, it's a very complex subject. I'm going to try to narrow this down now to like a very specific example. And I've said this and it's recorded. And so you can probably catch me saying this for years. Decentralized identity or identity in the Web3 space is a very complex problem that I don't believe that a single company or entity can fix. And so I think it's great to see so many different players in the space trying to solve different areas of identity in the Web3 space. I do believe, though, that once we find a solution, we need to find a way to come to an agreement to standardize and use that to move it forward. And then if there's other areas of that uh, identity problem that need to be resolved, then there's, again, that experimentation, that that broadening, if you will, of you know development, and then narrowing down again uh, through standardization. Just, just my response to all that. I tried just hard to leave you land in, Donnie. Sorry. No, go for it. Go for it. I, I was muting because I know that I could also run on a tangent. Yeah, I'd love to hear. Please go for a it. A rebuttal. Yeah. Or... No, no, no. Go for it. No, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I you were you were calling it out, and I was remembering one of the earlier gigs I got, sort of being a, a freelance kid just trying to make some money in college, and it was setting up a bonjour um, print server so that I could install software on someone's Microsoft laptops inside their home, and their Mac desktop would act as the print server and send print jobs to an adjacent printer that was designed with drivers for that computer. And, you know, it had to be able to receive those files and put them out. And 90% of the time it was fine, but every once in a while it wasn't. And that was where I made some money. You know, I had to set it up. And that, like, I remember Bonjour being an interesting one to mention because that was one of the earlier protocols that was actually implemented outside of the Apple ecosystem that was you know, capable of, of being used by multiple things. But yeah, it's also, I can't remember if it's IEEE or whatever the heck, like it was a IANA recognized protocol to say, hey, we expect Bonjour traffic to go over this, uh, you know, this port, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm getting a little bit in the weeds for some non-network engineer folk. But like Bonjour was a really big deal because of the way it was doing um, standardization and, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of other things that were pretty novel and surprising at that point between Macs and, and PCs. But yeah, I, I definitely agree with your point about standardization. That's just, that's why I feel like we're kind of in this infinite stuck. And I, I think you're right to point out that there isn't one solution. And I appreciate that very much because that's why this really is a revolution. That's why it's different. But, you know, I, I think it's it's going to take more of that gravity, not so much the uh, Magic the Gathering example, but the recognition of the value in Magic the Gathering. There's still Magic the Gathering tournaments today. Like, there's there's still a professional circuit. I, I bumped into it on TikTok a little while ago. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So someone found another, like, infinite loop, super, super hack, unbeatable, you know, series of cards kind of thing. Like, okay, cool. Um, but I, I just, I'm I'm a little bit frustrated for it um, as an infrastructure guy, because the way I keep seeing it line up is that there are multiple products and companies trying to do reasonably good work, but because the majority of them are kind of like based on investment that are based on their success, there has to be this profit model that comes with it. I, I remember when DNS was uh, like, I don't want to say I remember that, like I, I studied when DNS was forming and how that was working and, you know, how a bunch of different organizations started being willing to do something as silly as TCP, where they were exchanging way more packets than they needed to be, which was a big deal at the time, because, you know, pre-duplex internet, the way that most of us know, um, you know, links to behave over the internet, 
uh, t- types of networks were very common where everybody had to sort of shut up, wait for a message to come in, send the message out, and then everybody shut up, and then, okay, now we can send a message again or someone else can listen for a message. Like, it, it was very analog for a while there. I, I feel like that's kind of the mode that we're in, not because we're so prehistoric or whatever, but because of that, you know, compartmentalization, because of that, um, you know, segmentation between the different types of protocols and the, you know, capital incentives that are coming with them, because the capital incentives didn't really exist before in that, you know, earlier phase when people were, you know, aggregating more into a single unified, hey, we got to sell this stuff as an industry kind of mode. I think we'll get there exactly how Humpty described it, which is through multiple entities showing value. Because the idea that the one American company will set the standard and then it'll be the standard forever, like, that's a broken paradigm. That shit don't work anymore. Like, I, I can't think of a, of a of an industry where that has made sense in the past 10 or 20 years, maybe except for, like, a handful of things, like some wacky nanotech stuff. But, you know, uh, quantum computing is an easy example for that of, you know, how nobody wants to be the the one who sort of accepts using fewer qubits than their partner because, you know, they're not their partner, they're um, not adversary, but like their peer who would want to be using fewer qubits by choice when somebody else has double the amount of qubits and so on. But to, to not um, be a, a 3:30 AM or now 4 AM um, just wackadoo uh, go in without purpose on this. I do see a, a motivation to to get more unified, and it's not just oh hey we need better UX. Like we had our phase with that in crypto, and I'm super grateful for it. Like I said, I participated near protocol. I love that local storage in the Chrome browser is part of how near just works. Like I'm a super big fan of that. Do I think that everybody and their mother is going to adopt that? No. Is that already adapted for MetaMask? Yes. So I think there's going to be these little things here and there, and MetaMask is one of them, whether I like it or not, that are these, you know, gateways, bottlenecks, choke points, and that will be the productive thing that we can do for the time being, and we'll just have to keep doing that in series until there's enough cool shit to get Grandma to want to play Magic the Gathering, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And I I really hope this is not the last time you come up. You know, it sounds like this is really late for you, but um, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. I know we try to keep these within the hour, but it's very, it it just flew by. (laughs) The time just flew by. This was a wonderful Oh my God. It's been an hour and six minutes. (laughs) How is that? I thought it was like 40 minutes. I still thought it was 3.30. Holy. (laughs) Yeah. No, this, this, I mean, that's what happens when we have, you know, people come up on stage and just, share the stage with us right because that's that's the whole point i mean for anybody who's been here before you know donnie and i sure we can ramble on and explore you know some relevant topics and even change the topic uh, or the title of the space as we go if something feels more important than something else but when y'all come up to the to, to the space up here to the stage to talk with us this it just really I mean, obviously it makes the time go by much faster, but it makes the conversation that much more interesting. Show about nothing until it's about something. Always. That's the commonality between all of them. Yeah. Yeah. What's up, Joe? We're about to shut down the space. uh, Hey, what's up, Joe? Thank you. Hey, what's what's going on, guys? Thanks for having me. I appreciate this uh, convention of uh, old IT people talking. Uh, (laughs) A lot of stuff down memory lane here and these different protocols changing and everything else. Um, it's great, but what I just, I kind of want, I know you're wrapping up. I was just curious, just kind of everyone's thought as we talk about bringing it back to social is, you know, what do you think about the concept of a bridge towards web two of something like an activity pub standard, you know, where uh, Mastodon uses it, threads claims that they're going to use it. Uh, is that something where as people are building out social in web three, that that allows for some of that, you know, coming together, uh, across it? We actually were talking about this right at the beginning. I think it was one of the first things we talked about where I was exploring an idea I had in the shower this morning about an immutable gate to mutable phone stored content. Um, it, it, I, no one's built it yet, and I don't know if anybody ever will, but it's worth exploring the idea of making an ordinals inscription. So like a, a window, an HTML window that exists on Bitcoin and is not changeable 
that points to a I don't know a page on your phone where you just type things and put pictures there, and it's stored nowhere but on your device, um, and is not also stored anywhere else, and is gone as soon as you delete it, and something else pops up that you decide you want to show. I think this is a really good example of a way that things that are already integrated into our life and exist sort of conventionally can be used in conjunction with things that don't get utilized in a in a broader sense anyway. Um, that doesn't mean that everything we do in a social network has to be on chain. I think that this is this is something I've not seen happen before, I guess is what I'm saying, where the, the window to view something is immutable, but the content behind it is solely in control, uh, rather is controlled solely by the owner of the device. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, that's something that, you know, so I'm building over on your protocol and they have a social layer already kind of built into it. And one of the things that I know we butt up against with getting people on board is like, not everything wants to be stored forever. And I think they're, especially around social, right? Sometimes maybe you say something in the heat of the moment and all that stuff. But what I'm really curious though about, I think as you talk about, can we standardize some of this? Is at what point do we maybe think that the social paradigm as a whole was wrong, that it's maybe a little bit more about the smaller communities, right? Like where I feel like the larger social networking is more about branding and advertising myself and getting, you know, what I'm doing out there. But really the people I'm like making connections with is a much smaller cohort. So does that really need to be uh, on built onto like a larger platform? I mean, my inclination is no. I don't think that, um, I think it needs to be on a larger pl platform if people want to follow Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Dwayne The Rock Johnson wants <laughs> right. to be able to have a platform for it. But like in, in the example, just to go back to the example of the shower thought that I had, if there was a way that you could follow specific ordinals, as in like have those ordinals display on a separate screen that's next to your content screen, and you can choose who's basically status you want to view at any given time of a close friend group. It's sort of like a group chat where no one's talking to each other. They're just all kind of broadcasting whatever it is that they want. And you can opt in and out and change the group chat that you view. That sort of thing seems like it would solve a problem for me. But maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm the 10% that we're not building for in this case, you know? Yeah, it's hard for me to say. Um, yeah, I just, I just wonder, you know, as we start to think through these things, I, I love the idea of standardizing like email so that they can, you know, communicate, you know, as with these different services. But maybe though, it really needs to, it's better off being segmented where, you know, my parents would be on a different network and chatting their own way that maybe is a little bit different than the way I am. You know, it's, it, there's almost a, a point where I feel like we've tried to do everything so big and we're so conditioned from web two that everything has to be so, you know, uh, scalable all the way to, you know, eight, you know, all 8 billion people, or maybe now it's actually a little bit more of a pullback to something that's a little more manageable and realistic for human connection. Um, yeah, I, I would say sounds it's, like it's hard to talk about that already. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, can hear you. Me? Joe, can you hear oh, okay. Humpty? I don't think Joe can hear me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Joe, can you not hear Humpty? Yeah, I can hear Humpty. him. Okay, oh, cool. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, anyways, just, uh, you know, as we wrap up, I did what, just want to um, address that. And I think I think we might see, a, we're, we might be seeing an example of how we can bridge those conversations but we're probably seeing it from a different lens right now. And um, think about when you are using a native token on a blockchain, and I might be completely off on this. This is just literally off the cuff. But when you're using a native token on a blockchain uh, versus when you're using a wrapped token on a blockchain, right? You have to bridge your assets across uh, networks to be able to use that value or, 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 or that network's like, token. Um, however, it might not necessarily be compatible everywhere, right? So in this case, let's assume we're talking about ETH, or maybe we can even talk about BTC. You may be able to use, I mean, you will be able to use ETH everywhere on the Ethereum network, but you may likely not be able to use wrapped ETH everywhere because it's not 
acceptable everywhere, right? It's not accepted everywhere. Potentially to the point of like trying to bridge Web2 clients or Web2 um, you know, infrastructure to Web3, we may be able to find a way to integrate it, but it won't, like you won't probably likely uh, have the native support and native interactions that you would if you like operating on the, on the network or on the platform natively, right? So th that's just like what came to my head. It's like, sure, like there could be a way to integrate something like ActivityPub, but would you be able to use that platform in its, you know, complete rich entirety using some bridge like that, right? Some inter integration like that versus just doing it natively. And I think we probably will see support for something like that, where people will be able to bridge over identities from a traditional Web2 uh, network onto some Web3 platform, but they will be very limited in what they can do because they're not able to leverage all of the technology um, that, that, that basically takes advantage on the underlying tech, you know, uh, infrastructure or, or protocols like we've been talking about now or, or for the last hour. Um, this is my thoughts. I could be completely wrong and probably am. But um, as we're 14 minutes past the hour and I want to be respectful of everyone's time and I do have to step away, um, just wanted to thank everyone for jumping in today because this is been a really fun conversation. It's one of the smallest spaces that we've had in a very long time. Donnie and I were actually talking about that earlier. We've had spaces usually averaging around 100 in the audience, but very few participants. Whereas like now, where we're like sub 10, it's a really vibrant panel. So maybe that says something for... Sorry? I was going to say that I think people are more willing to come up on stage when there's not 700 people viewing, especially it's a little bit off-putting when there's like 700 and there, are they bots or are they just all down there? And it changes the dynamic on stage. I don't like big stages. I'm glad we did it this way. Also, if you're wrong, Humpty, everybody's wrong because the next person who does something more right just proves everybody wrong. So like all we're, all anyone's doing is throwing ideas around here. So, you know, wrong and right are kind of like non-existent in my head anyway. Yep. Thank you for being you. Thank you. And everyone who came up today, please, we're, we're back here next week. Same, uh, same time, same, same time, same channel, I want to say. But I just remembered I'm going to be in Austin. I'm going to be flying back from permissionless. I don't know what time my flight leaves, but I might be in the middle of the air during this call. And Donnie, you might be too. So Actually, yeah. I fly out at 4 p.m. from Austin, so it'll be right around then. Yeah, so we may actually have to skip or move this up a day or a couple of hours. And it'd be fun, Donnie, if you and I could actually do this live from Austin together, because we normally do this virtually uh, from opposing parts of uh, the US. I think by the time it's four in on the, well, I guess where I'm coming from, it's four, and then it'll be two there. So I actually, we could do it from the airport, I think. Maybe, Honestly, yeah, let me yeah, see. Let's try. Might be able I'll to double check what time my flight leaves too. And if not, we'll figure something out, but please everybody just stay tuned and do Come join us again because this this was a really fun chat. I we I personally appreciate you all for coming up here, Sheldon and Joe and Donnie, of course. Yeah, you can say we. I appreciate you too. Yeah, it was fun, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Get some sleep, Sheldon. It's late. <laughs> I got stuff to do. <laughs> it's right. not coming through in your speech. I'm just saying it's man. Four thirty is a lot. Godspeed. Thanks, guys. Pleasure. <laughs>